Hello everyone. This lesson is going to be on the female reproductive cycle or the menstrual cycle. This lesson is really a continuation of the previous one, which was on the female reproductive system. But when we do talk about the female's reproductive cycle, the standard that we use in most biology textbooks, and definitely for the purposes of Biology 30, is talking about a 28-day period of time, a cycle during which there are a whole bunch of changes that are taking place in the female in terms of hormones in her body, what's going on in the ovaries, what's going on in the uterus. But really the point of this 28-day menstrual cycle is the development, the maturation, and the eventual release of one single ovum or oocyte or egg. The cycle, as we'll see, is regulated by changes in hormones. Just like we saw with the male reproductive system, we're going to have the hypothalamic hormone, gonadotropic releasing hormone, which is going to be telling the anterior pituitary to produce the two gonadotropic hormones, which are follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, or L or LH. In the case of the male, these two hormones are going to target the testes, and the hormone that's going to be produced there by the latex cells, as we saw before, is the male sex hormone testosterone. The two graphs down below, what they do show is that if we take a look at the course of one day, the beginning to the end of the day, the testosterone production, the concentration in the blood of the male, yeah, it does fluctuate a little bit. It does go up and down. But if we take a look at the graph beside it, this is now over the course of not just a day, but a whole month. And the blood testosterone concentration. And when we take a look at this, well, we can see that it's, well, pretty boring. It's just a straight line. In other words, it doesn't really fluctuate in any way whatsoever. This continues month after month, year after year. We did see, of course, that as a male does age, eventually the production of testosterone goes down. But in terms of the monthly fluctuations, there's really not much of a change at all. But we're going to see that, it's in the, that in the case of the female, there will be considerable changes that are taking place throughout the 28-day menstrual cycle. We divide the female's reproductive or menstrual cycle into four different distinct phases. So I've been using the terms both reproductive and menstrual. So when we talk about and use the term reproductive cycles, we're talking about changes that are taking place in the female's ovaries and also changes that are taking place in the uterus as well. So we can break this down a little bit further, as I've done here, and I'll talk about exactly what is going on in the ovaries, the events that are taking place, and the term that goes along with it, and the time period. And I'll also talk about exactly what is going on in the uterus, the events, the names for those events, and again, the timing. The term menstrual cycle is really referring to the process of menstruation, which is the shedding off of the female's uterus. So that truly is a part of the uterine cycle, although quite often we do use the terms reproductive cycle and menstrual cycle interchangeably. At any rate, so here I'm going to talk about the four different distinct phases of the female's reproductive cycle. So the first one takes place over a course of a period of about one to five days. So all of these numbers that I'm throwing out, they are going to be averages. So 28 days is an average, but there may in fact be very few females that actually have strictly a 28-day menstrual cycle. This first phase, the follicular and flow phase, um, here I have it in brackets as days one to five, or days one to five, just meaning that, yeah, in some cases it may be a single day, in other females it may be a longer, three, four, or five days. So what I'm trying to do here by using the backslash is I'm trying to show before the backslash what is taking place in the ovary. So the first phase in the ovary, it is referred to as the follicular phase, and what is going on in the uterus, that is referred to as the flow phase in the uterus. So what exactly is taking place during the follicular phase? Well, inside the ovaries, there are a number of different eggs that begin to develop at the start of each one of the female's reproductive cycles. So the number can vary again considerably. It might be 10, 15, 20 eggs that begin to develop out of the several hundred thousand that a female does have. So what we do have is the early growth of those eggs and supporting cells around the outside, which are called the follicles or the follicular cells. 
So these cells will divide, they will increase in number and increase in size. And this is taking place during the first five days or the follicular phase in the ovaries. What's going on in the uterus? The shedding off of the endometrial lining. The endometrial lining is the innermost lining of the female's uterus, and it is specifically designed to support an embryo and a fetus if implantation does take place. If implantation doesn't take place, then at the start of each of the female's reproductive cycles in the uterine cycle, that endometrium is going to be shed off. Now, the endometrium is a very vascular tissue, meaning it has a very, very rich blood supply. So along with the shedding off of the endometrium, there is going to be some blood released as well, and that's why this is also referred to as the bleeding phase. So again, this is approximately days one through five in most females. So if we go on to the second phase that I have here, in terms of the ovary, well, it's still going to be the follicular phase. So what do we now have? Well, the continued maturation of those follicles that begin to develop or did begin to develop earlier on in the follicular phase, responding to gonadotropic hormones and as those follicles do get bigger, they're going to bump up the production of estrogen. This is one of the sources of the estrogen. Eventually, what's going to happen over the course of the follicular phase is out of all of those eggs or ovums that begin to develop, eventually just one of them, at least in humans anyway, it's usually just one of them that eventually dominates, and it's going to send out a chemical message to all of the other ones, not just in that ovary, but in the other ovary as well, eventually leading to their degeneration. So when we do reach the point that we have a mature egg, it is typically just one mature egg that is then available between the two ovaries. That's what's going on inside of the ovaries. How about in the uterus? Well, in the uterus, this is now referred to as the proliferative phase. Remember that during the flow phase, the endometrium is going to be shed off. It's exactly the opposite during the proliferative phase. This is where we're going to have the thickening of the endometrium. So it's shed off, and right after that, it's going to undergo this thickening. The third phase is just really a one-day event, and that's at day 14. So it's at day 14 that the solid organ, the ovary, is going to push that one mature follicle with the one egg inside of it, push it to the surface, and eventually that portion of the ovary wall is going to rupture, and it's going to release the egg that can then be captured by the end of the fallopian tube, the fimbriae, and drawn into the fallopian tube. Nothing really to say here about what is going on inside of the uterus, although it would be the continuum, continuing of the thickening of the uterine lining, the endometrial lining. Now going on to the fourth phase, what's going on in the ovaries is referred to as the luteal phase. After the follicle ruptures and after the egg is released and is drawn into the fallopian tubes, there are still many of the follicular cells that stay behind that are not released along with the egg. And those ones that stay behind that are still inside of the ovary, they are transformed into a structure which is called the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum, yes, it forms from what are called the remnant follicular cells after the ovum or the egg is released. If fertilization does not occur, this corpus luteum, it does have a finite lifetime and it's going to degenerate after about 10 days. So what we'll see is that the corpus luteum it is going to produce a fairly significant amount of the previous ovarian hormone that we already saw, estrogen, but it's also going to start to produce progesterone. So both estrogen and progesterone are going to increase during the luteal phase. What's going on in the uterus? Well, this is now referred to as the secretory phase. So we already have the endometrial lining that is fairly thick. There is going to be a little bit more thickening, but for the most part, we say that what is taking place during the second half of the first, uh, first phase, if we just go back to this one here, or sorry, the second half of uh, 
the second phase that I have, the proliferative phase. That's where we're going to have the thickening of the endometrium. So we'll see in some pictures that that is going to continue a little bit further into the secretory phase, but really most of the thickness of the endometrium has already been established. We do have the secretion of nutrients onto the surface of the, of the endometrium, which will allow for supporting that embryo when it does attach and eventually implant into the endometrium. And we talk more about, rather than the thickening of the endometrium, the maintaining of the endometrium during the second half of the female's reproductive cycle. So we'll take a look at a few different graphs here, a few different pictures. Let me just uh, jump ahead here. So this will be the entire picture that eventually we'll take a look at, and you have a handout that looks exactly like this. And what it does show here are the two different ovarian hormones. This one down here, is, or sorry, the one at the top are the two different gonadotropic hormones. The one at the bottom here are the two different ovarian hormones. We can see some hormone production regulation by the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary, again, very similar to with the male reproductive system. Right in the middle, events that are taking place in the ovary, and at the bottom, events that are taking place in the uterus. So let's go back just so I can zoom in a little bit more on a couple of these. So uh, yeah, the picture right at the top, just like we saw with the male reproductive system, where we have the hypothalamus that's producing the releasing hormone, gonadotropic releasing hormone, telling the anterior pituitary to produce these two here. Again, these ones are the gonadotropic hormones, FSH and LH. These ones here in the male, they were targeting the testes, and the female are going to be targeting the ovaries. The primary female sex hormones, estrogen and progesterone, they are going to have a negative feedback just like we saw a negative feedback from testosterone in the male. And that's what, well, these two negative feedbacks are showing here in this picture. But we're also going to come across for the first time a positive feedback, which also has to do with, well, it says here estradiol, but that is what we will refer to as estrogen. So the graph in the middle is showing the fluctuations in the two gonadotropic hormones, LH and FSH. So what you need to know for these two hormones and the two different ovarian hormones as well is really three different things in terms of the graph. First of all, what is the level or the change that we're seeing? So if we take a look at the follicle-stimulating hormone, the pattern, the description, is we would say that it's relatively high at the beginning. There's a little bit of a peak about midway through the menstrual cycle, and the rest of the time it's relatively low. So high at the beginning, and then it drops off, a little bit of a peak halfway through, and then it drops off for the remainder of the female's ovarian cycle or reproductive cycle. So that would be the change that we do see. Second thing that you need to know is what is the cause of that change? So it's higher at the beginning and then it starts to go down. What's the reason for that? And thirdly, what is the effect? So if we take a look at the other hormone here, the LH, we see that there is this huge burst, mid-cycle burst or just before mid-cycle. What is the effect? So we need to know what is the change for each one of these hormones? What is the cause of the change and what is the effect of that change? And if I just scroll down to the bottom, it does have here as well the different phases. And this is showing the different ovarian phases. So all of these pictures that we see here, these are events that are taking place strictly in the ovaries, not in the uterus. And we have the names that do go along with the ovarian cycle. So as we already saw, the follicular phase, ovulation, the luteal phase, and of course we have the time scale along the bottom here, the standard 28-day time scale that we do use. So what about these two different hormones and the fluctuations that we see? So for follicle-stimulating hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone is going to stimulate the follicle. So in order to do that, well, we want to have a fairly high level. When do we need to be stimulating the follicles? Well, it's at the beginning, right? It's during the follicular phase at the beginning where we need to be stimulating these follicles so we get cell division taking place, we get an enlargement of the follicles. That's when we need to have that stimulation is early on. So that's going to be the effect of the higher levels of FSH that we see here. 
that's going to be the effect to stimulate the follicle. What causes the FSH to be high? Well, if we sort of go back to where the FSH is produced, well, it's produced in the anterior pituitary. And if we sort of twist it around, if there were high levels of estrogen, then there would be a negative feedback, and FSH would not be produced. Here we do have FSH produced. So what does that mean? Well, that means there's no negative feedback because there's not enough estrogen. Early on in the female's reproductive cycle, there is not a sufficient amount of estrogen to have a negative feedback on the hypothalamus or the anterior pituitary. So what does that allow for? It allows for an increase in follicle-stimulating hormone. That's why we see the higher level of follicle-stimulating hormone, and that's exactly what we want if we need to be stimulating those follicles early on during the first few days of the follicular phase. That's really the key with follicle stimulating hormone. Um, yes, we do have this little bit of a burst here, but as we'll see, it's really not that significant. The FSH, where we really want to have the levels a little bit higher and where it is important, is right at the beginning of the reproductive cycle. What about the other hormones? So the LH. So in the case of the LH, for the most part, well, what really stands out is, again, this mid-cycle burst. For the rest of the cycle, really not much of a change at all. So it's this one that we're going to kind of zoom in on. So that's the change that we do see. What does it actually cause? Well, if we follow this big black arrow that's going down here, it coincides with this event. So in order to have ovulation, in order to have the egg being released from the follicle that's inside of the ovary, in order to have it released and drawn into the fallopian tube eventually, we need to have this spike in luteinizing hormone. If this spike doesn't happen, then ovulation doesn't happen. If there's anything that blocks this follicle stimulating hormone from reaching this peak, then you're not going to have ovulation taking place. So LH, what do we see for the change? A big mid-cycle burst or just before mid-cycle. What is the effect of that? Ovulation. Ah, but now, why is there this mid-cycle burst? So we'll take a look at estrogen in a minute, but what we do see here and what I circled right in the middle is a positive feedback. So low, moderate levels of estrogen have a negative feedback, but when we do have higher levels of estrogen, it switches over and it becomes positive feedback. So what we'll see is that right around this time as well, there are high enough levels of estrogen that now it can convert from a negative to a positive feedback. What does that mean? Well, increase in gonadotropic releasing hormone, Increase in FH, which we do see, but the key here is the increase in luteinizing hormone because that is the one that's going to cause the ovulation. So we have the fluctuation, we have the effect of that fluctuation, and now we have the cause of that fluctuation as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at the two ovarian hormones, um, estrogen and progesterone. If we take a look at the estrogen, a really important shape that you need to recognize here, estrogen does increase during the first half of the reproductive cycle. It also increases again a second time. So we kind of see these two bumps here. This is the first bump, and this is the second bump over the course of 28 days. It increases, and then it drops and then it increases again. This is the pattern that we do see with the estrogen. So let's take a look at what is the cause of these changes. Well, as the follicles are growing inside of the ovaries, those large follicles are starting to produce more and more estrogen. So right at the beginning, follicles are really small, not a lot of follicular cells, so we're going to have very, very little estrogen that's being produced early on. As we do get bigger and bigger follicles, and eventually the one single mature follicle, 
what we're going to get is more and more estrogen that is being produced. So if we do take a look at the graph for the estrogen, well, that's exactly what we see is the amount of estrogen is going to be going up. Now, keep in mind that through most of this, so as we get more and more and more and more estrogen, we're going to get a negative feedback upon the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary. And this is why the amount of follicle stimulating hormone and really LH as well is going to be going down. But then something happens as soon as it reaches kind of this critical value. When it reaches this value, all of a sudden that's when it flips over. It flips over from the negative to the positive feedback. So now we see the changes. We see the effect of the changes, or sorry, the cause of these changes, and now the effect. So what is the estrogen actually doing? Well, now if we go down and if we take a look at the uterine cycle, what is taking place in the uterus as we see a change in the amount of estrogen? Well, early on, it's really, really low. The function of estrogen is to maintain or to increase the thickness of the endometrial lining. So if estrogen is really, really low, the endometrial lining simply cannot be maintained. So what does that mean? It's going to be shed off. So that is our flow phase. What is the reason for the flow phase? It's because the estrogen is very, very low, and it can no longer maintain that endometrial lining. Why is the estrogen going to be really, really low? Well, because we don't have enough follicles to produce a sufficient amount of estrogen at this time. But now what happens? Well, the follicles get bigger. They produce more and more estrogen. As they produce more and more estrogen, what does that estrogen do? It increases the thickness of the endometrial lining. So that is really the function during the first half of the menstrual cycle. Now the estrogen is to increase the thickness of the endometrial lining. And again, in terms of the name that goes along with that in the uterine cycle, that is the proliferative phase. Then as we know, what happens at the midway point is we get an increase in LH, we get ovulation. Now we're going to have not only that egg that's released, but a bunch of the follicular cells. We can't really see it in the picture here. A bunch of these follicular cells, they will be lost as well. And if they're lost out of the ovary, well, what that means is that the production of the estrogen, it's going to drop off, at least temporarily. So we do see that. We see it decreases around mid-cycle after ovulation does take place. But after ovulation, there are still a whole bunch of those follicular cells that are still inside of the uterus, or sorry, inside of the ovaries. So those follicular cells that remain behind, they are transformed into this structure here that is visible, yellowish structure, as it shows in the picture, right on the surface of the ovary, and that is called the corpus luteum. So the corpus luteum, kind of like the growing follicles, it's bigger and bigger and bigger, and as it gets bigger and bigger, it's going to produce not only the female sex hormone estrogen, but also progesterone. So yes, it does show already a little bit of estrogen production here, but for you, what you really need to understand is that estrogen, where we get the increase, is really during the second half of the reproductive cycle. So that is corresponding to the luteal phase in terms of the ovary, and what's going on in the uterus is the secretory phase. So with the estrogen and progesterone, yes, it does have here, they're going to promote a little bit more thickening of the endometrial lining, but it's more so that maintenance. Maintenance of the endometrial lining, because it's already relatively thick, at the end of the, the end of the second phase, the proliferative phase, before we go into the secretory phase. So let's take a look at all of this together now on one single picture. So most of this we've talked about, just a few other things that I've added to the side here we can chat about. So we do have an increase in, so I have here a slide that's all kind of relative. That is where we do have more of the FSH is early on in the female's reproductive or menstrual cycle. So what is it going to be doing? It's going to be stimulating those follicles, initiating the development of several of these eggs within the female's two ovaries. 
So that's going to be fairly early on, and that's the FSH that we're talking about right here, the increase. For the LH, fairly stable throughout, not really much of a fluctuation, except the huge mid-cycle burst for the LH. That is key for you to understand that this is what is going to initiate through positive feedback. That is what's going to initiate the process of ovulation. For the ovarian hormones, estrogen, normally a negative feedback on the anterior pituitary. So as the levels go up, the production of FSH and LH is going to go down. But at higher concentrations, just before mid-cycle, it has a positive feedback. So that's going to be right about here where we do have that positive feedback. And then finally, estrogen and progesterone are produced by the corpus luteum. So those two hormones, these ones here that we're talking about, this is during the luteal phase. I kind of like this picture here, which actually does show the well, menstrual cycle, reproductive cycle as a cycle. So we do designate as day one is the beginning of um, the bleeding phase or the flow phase. So a lot of things going on with this picture here. So what it does show right around in this region is the level of estrogen and progesterone. So the single darker dot in the middle, dark green dot, that's going to be the estrogen. So we can see it's fairly low all along here. And then all of a sudden, the amount, the size of this green dot, the amount of estrogen, it's going to be going up. <clears throat> See then, it's not as big here, so the amount of estrogen is going to be dropping. And then during the second half, when we have the corpus luteum, we're going to see an increase in the amount of estrogen again. So kind of nicely shows that, the fluctuation visually in the amount of estrogen. The um, bluish ring around the outside of the green dot is going to be the progesterone. So all through the first half, we don't really see much of a change in the size of this blue ring around the outside. But now take a look at it here. So much, much, much more progesterone being produced. Again, now being produced by the corpus luteum, and that's during the luteal phase, the second half of the menstrual cycle. Right around the very outside, it shows the uterine cycle. So the thickness of the uterine lining. Very, very thin at the beginning because it's just been shed off. We can see through the first half, that's where most of the thickening is taking place. So that's why we say the function of the estrogen is to increase the thickness of the uterus, of the endometrial lining. Notice that between these lines that I show here, over here, and at the end, there's not really that much of a change in the thickness. So we don't really say so much that the second half is for the thickening of the endometrial lining. We now say that the estrogen and progesterone is for maintaining the thickness of the endometrial lining. This is the hormone regulation in a female, and I just wanted to quickly uh, put this up here so we can again see the negative feedback on the right-hand side, very, very similar to what we've seen with a number of other hormones before, growth hormone, for example, and cortisol production. But it's the same sort of pattern, um, and testosterone, but it's the same pattern that we have with the estrogen and the progesterone, the two ovarian hormones. The one exception, and the reason for me showing this to you, is that we don't only have the negative feedback, this is the negative feedback here, but on the other side, this is the positive feedback. So most of the time, it's a negative feedback, but we do get a positive feedback for a very short period of time during the female's reproductive or menstrual cycle, and that's usually somewhere around days 12 to 14 on average. Just a couple of other things here. Um, menopause, when a female, a human female is born, uh, what we do say is that she has all of the eggs that she will ever have. And that is somewhere on the order of uh, three, four, five hundred thousand. 
So a number of these eggs, once a female does read adolescence, uh, puberty, sexual maturity, a number of those eggs within each ovary are going to begin to develop. Most of them will not make it at the start of each uh, menstrual cycle. So what that means is that eventually the female is going to run out of eggs in the ovaries. And that's somewhere around 500 cycles that a female does have. So what happens after these 500 cycles? Well, now we have what is referred to as menopause. So not only is the female um, running out of eggs and not have any more eggs, ovulation is not going to take, any pla take place anymore, we're going to have a change in the hormones as well and menstruation is now going to also cease. So menopause, we talk about that in humans, uh, usually don't talk about it too much in other animals and primary reason is probably because most other mammals would keep, uh, reach that age where they actually survive long enough to run out of their eggs. And there's also some indication that in other mammals, um, eggs might continue to be, be produced throughout the female's lifetime. In many other mammal species, um, they don't have a menstrual cycle, but instead what they have is referred to as an estrous cycle. So the menstrual cycle is the case with humans and possibly some of our closest relatives on the evolutionary scale as well, some of the other primates, but most other mammals, what they do experience is referred to as an estrous cycle. So in this case here, no visible signs of the shedding off of the endometrium. The endometrium is reabsorbed by the uterus. Sexual receptivity, um, the only time when they are receptive to the advances of the males and are interested in reproducing is during estrus, which is also referred to as heat. The length and frequency of the estrus cycle, it's going to vary considerably from species to species. In some mammals, it may only be once a year or even less frequently than that, and in others, it may be multiple times throughout the year. 